Welcome everybody to our May webinar. This is Michael Campana coming to you live from Corvallis, Oregon, and actually that's where our speaker is coming from today. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Lackey, will be talking on the use and abuse of science in water resource policy and management. And uh, here is our speaker today, and um, Bob has had a distinguished career. He's now a professor, professor of fisheries and wildlife at Oregon State University, and um, for many years was um, with the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I, I do appreciate your opportunity to participate in this seminar. Uh, it's certainly a topic near and dear to my heart. When I was asked to present something, my first thought was, you know, what exactly are you going to present to a group like this? They're well experienced, a diversity of kinds of things and so forth. But let me just start off with a little bit of background about the context of what I'm going to present. My career started, the first phase of it is probably similar to some of your, most of your careers in that it was pretty much in science, science research and so forth. And I found this, this was my academic training, I found this to be comfortable, it was understandable, the rules were clear cut, you did your research and perhaps you published in a peer reviewed literature and things were pretty good. Uh, not a lot of controversy, certainly you had a hustle for money and so forth, but generally speaking it was fairly straightforward. But late in this period, which lasted about 15 years, I got more and more involved with the interface with policy people. And so the second phase in my career, which was somewhat longer, was interacting with policy makers, uh, policy analysts, people who make decisions, political people, and those kinds of folks, and essentially being a science interface. Now to me, as a hardcore scientist, this was a scary world. But it was fascinating. I mean, I learned an awful lot. And I did that for quite a few years and found it to be quite enjoyable, but frustrating in many areas, in many situations. And a third part of my career, third phase, was going back to academia, which is where I'm at now at Oregon State University. And this afforded a time to kind of analyze and reflect. And so when Michael asked me if I could present some comments, my question essentially was, what about insights that I've learned over my career that might be useful to other people about the use and abuse of science? And so that's what you're going to hear today. Now let me give you my bottom line take home message. And that is, in my view, water resource management, natural resource management, all these kinds of fields, that the misuse of science has become increasingly common. And I think over my career, I've seen it increase in misuse, and I think this has undermined the confidence that people have, both the public and decision makers and policy makers, in the entire scientific enterprise. So this is my take home message. So the rest of my comments are essentially going to be a roadmap to how I got to this conclusion. And let's start kind of first principles, go back to philosophy 101. Here's Francis Bacon, the popularizer of what these days we call science. Now science, or the scientific method, is how you arrive at the information. Science is just simply information. But science has four characteristics. If it doesn't have all these four characteristics, it's still information, but it's not science as we traditionally use it. It's rational, it's not faith-based, does not require any basically orders from anybody else if you take on faith. It's systematic, that is, it's logical, you follow a certain path, you can describe it. It's testable, that is other people can take measurements and come up to the same general conclusions that you do. And it's reproducible, that is if other people follow your methods, your procedures, they'll come up with the same answer within a range of error. And of course if they don't, then that means the scientific conclusion, the information hasn't been confirmed and you go back to the drawing board and come up with a new hypothesis. So that's the scientific method. Now science is not value free. We decide what problems we work on or our boss tells us what problems we'll work on or we'll get a grant or some research funding to do a certain thing. That decision is in fact a value judgment because there's a zillion things that we could do science on. But somehow we either individually select or somebody selects for us the kinds of problems we work on. Plus, we could look at other ways to gather information, not just the scientific method. So science is not value-free, but it is expected to be policy neutral. 
That is, there is no built-in policy preference in science. Science just deals with the is. This is the way the world is. It doesn't deal with the way the world should be or ought to be. And ideally, at least if it's paid for by the public, public money, it should be policy relevant. Most of us, at least in my career, I didn't do science just to advance knowledge. It was really designed to answer provide useful information to policymakers to help make decisions. So ideally, it's policy relevant, uh, and not only that, it's policy neutral. Now, how important is science in water resource policy and management? Bottom line, not as important as many people think, nor is it particularly important in natural resource management or other fields. It's not unimportant. It's not unuseful. It is useful. It is important. But it's not at the core of most policy debates. Not only that, it's only one type of information. There are plenty of other types of information. And if you go across campus here or elsewhere and talk to political scientists, they'll make the argument that other inputs are arguably more important than scientific inputs. Now, to be helpful in policy making and management, scientists must be trusted. Because if you brief a politician, if you brief a senior manager or a senior policymaker, or really anybody else, they're not almost assuredly not going to be scientists in that particular field. And so trust in scientists is very crucial. The public doesn't understand science. So they essentially, if they're going to believe science, they have to trust whoever's presenting it. So the question on a table is, uh, what's the level of trust that people have in scientists and by implication, science? And that's a very hard question to answer. Here is one survey done a few years ago, and this was part of a large national survey. And one question on there dealt with the extent to which average, asking average people, how much do you trust scientists to present unbiased science about environmental issues? Now, this is not water resources, so it's not exactly the question, but it's as close as I could find to the degree that the public has about trusting scientists. So think to yourself, how would you answer this question? And how do you think the public would answer this question? How trusting they are of scientists when I talk about environmental issues? Well, the sobering conclusions to me were that four in 10 Americans say they place little or no trust in what scientists have to say about the environment. Now, you might jump to the conclusion, well, the other six are, that's not too bad, 60% trust. Not true. The other 6 in 10, the other 60%, weren't all that trusting. So you got 4 in 10 place little or no trust, and most of the other 6 were lukewarm. Well, who is it out there in public that distrusts scientists? When I ask graduate students in policy classes, they almost uniformly say, well, it's pretty clear. It's the right part of the political spectrum that doesn't trust scientists. Well, when all else fails, Let's look at some data. Unfortunately, there's only a few issues that have polling data, so we're going to have to extract from these few issues to the general case. And those few issues are GMOs, particularly GMO agriculture, fluoridation of drinking water and the health effects of fluoridation, climate change, particularly the degree to which change in climate is caused by human factors. There's not a lot of argument about the fact climate changes. The question is how much are humans affecting it? and childhood vaccinations, and that is, what is the safety the risks of childhood vaccinations? Now think for your, to yourself, if you look at these four case studies, where is the skepticism of science going to be greatest? My guess is that you probably will say climate change, and you would be wrong. The greatest skepticism of science is in GMOs. And that skepticism comes primarily from the left side of the political spectrum. The second greatest degree of skepticism of science comes from climate change, particularly the human role. And that skepticism comes from the political right. Fluoridation of drinking water has been around forever. And I live very close to Portland, city of Portland in the northwest. And this area, the city, has fluoridated its water for 60 years. Last year, they voted, and Portland is an extremely liberal city, 
to stop fluoridating. And the polling data in Florida showed that people didn't trust the science. So fluoridation skepticism comes primarily from the left. Childhood vaccinations, if you look at the childhood vaccinations rates, you would say, well, it's probably going to be in some rural county in Mississippi that has very low childhood vaccination rates. People opt out. Not true. The lowest vaccination rates are along the states, the West Coast states, particularly California, and particularly Marin County, just above San Francisco. And those of you who know that area know Marin County is no way a bastion of right-wing zealots. So skepticism on childhood vaccinations, again, comes primarily from the political left. So what conclusion? My conclusion is, well, you don't want to overinterpret the data. But I think it's safe to say that skepticism tends to come from across the political spectrum. And it varies by issue. Uh, but it's pretty much across the range. Well, how is actually in practice is science used and abused in water resource management policy? And this is from the second phase of my career dealing with the interface of scientists and policy people. And from that, I really identify two realities I think help explain it. The first policy reality, and I think an extremely important one, and I've already touched on it somewhat, science is not the key to resolving policy and management disputes. It's important, perhaps even essential, and can be very useful, but it's not at the key. And I want to illustrate this with a case study. And the case study I'm going to use is the Cape Wind Project. And the Cape Wind Project is a, what's going to be a large project off the coast of Massachusetts, particularly off Nantucket. And this was a project that was supported by the federal government, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and lots of others. And the idea was that it would be a prototype for wind projects up and down both coasts uh, and basically be a harbinger of the future. And I want to focus on the study to illustrate the role of science in public policy. Now, just a brief background on wind power, and most of us have a pretty good idea, but just to confirm this, this is not your little house on the prairie of a little windmill on the farm. These are industrial-scale projects, and you can see in the upper right here, a human is dwarfed by the size of these structures. Also, with wind power, the transmission lines in the lower left uh, slide, or lower left photograph, are oftentimes more controversial than the actual project. And of course, like all energy projects, they have side effects that are not uh, ideal. And this one, uh, wind projects tend to kill a lot of birds and bats. And there's advocates who find that uh, rather unappealing. So here's the bottom line. After spending 12 years and many millions of dollars, a lot of it taxpayer money, the Cape Wind project collapsed. And almost assuredly, it's not going to be built. So what we want to look at and figure out is what role did science play, and more specifically, what role did scientists play? So let's look at this project. Now we tend, we being scientists, tend to look at projects, well, there's scientists that provide science on the left into the political process, and out pops a decision. And that decision is informed by advocates of different types who support the project, and other advocates who tend to oppose it. And so if there's a problem with this, that's basically because we lack science, if we had more science or better science, more relevant science, the decision would be reasonably obvious and we could move on with life. Well, let's look at this project a little more closely. Let's deconstruct the case study, kind of a first level deconstruction. We have climate advocates, as we did in the Cape Wind project, who are pushing this project. Hey, their argument will be, look, we need to reduce our carbon footprint, emissions. Let's get cracking on this project. It's already too late. Let's get moving on it. But we have other advocates who would say, not in my backyard. It may be a great idea. I just don't want it here. And for this particular project, being off Nantucket, Nantucket's an area where a lot of very wealthy people have summer homes, and there's a lot of other folks too, but the, the, 
a lot of affluent uh, individuals live there, and they weren't necessarily too happy with having looking out at a wind farm off their back deck or front deck. So they opposed the project. And then we have other interest groups, and I just identify the Audubon. There's plenty of other ones here. The Audubon Club, the Audubon Society, in essence, would oppose the project because it's going to kill a lot of birds. After all, it is located on the Atlantic Flyway, and they would say, well, wind may be okay, just not here. And then we have groups like the American Wind Energy Association, which is a basic industry group of companies that either make or install uh, these projects. And these are not little mom and pop companies. These are large multinationals who make the equipment. And they're going to, of course, be arguing in this entire process of, let's build it. Let's get on with this one and all the other ones, too. And then we have solar advocates. <clears throat> now, these projects go because they either get tax credits or tax subsidies. And there is a limited <clears throat> supply of those. And so a lot of those subsidies might also go to solar advocates. So solar advocates are kind of between a rock and a hard place. They don't want to come out and be opposed to wind power, but by the same token, they want to work get as many of those tax credits as they can. So they're probably going to take the view as, well, in general terms, we're supportive, but you know, solar is a lot more efficient. We can do this a lot easier. We don't have any, such a big bird problem, et cetera, et cetera. So the, but the solar advocates play in this arena. And then we have, in Cape Wind, the fishing advocates. This area has been fished for hundreds of years, and the fishing advocates will make the argument, look, we've been fishing here for over 300 years. Uh, what are we supposed to do when we drag our nets to these areas, avoid all these wind turbines? Uh, we've got underground, underwater cables we're going to get hooked on. This is going to ruin our life. 300 years of cultural heritage if this project goes forward. We oppose it. And we used to use this case study in you know, the graduate policy class, and some of the eagle-eyed students in there identified that, hey, NBC and MSNBC had a lot of puff pieces. Puff pieces are new, things that look like news, but they're really designed to push a particular uh, agenda. They had a lot of puff pieces on wind power. And so these bright, uh, <coughs> I guess, skeptical students said, well, who owns NBC at that time? and MSNBC was General Electric. And surprise, surprise, General Electric is the world's second largest manufacturer of wind turbines. And so it's not surprising that the media outlet that they owned might pitch uh, wind power. Now, just to be aware, NBC is no longer owned by General Electric. It's owned by Comcast. So if you listen to a report on the pros and cons of net neutrality on NBC, you want to be skeptical given that Comcast now owns it. And then we have the taxpayers. Now, Warren Buffett is on record multiple times saying, I love wind power. I love solar power, too. I don't care about those projects, but I care about the tax credits. They're worth a lot of money. So I invest in these projects because I want the tax credits. And of course, that is exactly what those tax credits were designed to do, pick winners and losers. If the government wants to create a market and activity for wind power and solar power and other kinds of things is you basically put resources in there, picking winners and losers. The counter argument is, is, look, why is the government, why are taxpayers picking winners and losers? Let the market decide. If people won't put their personal money in these projects, that ought to tell you something. But of course, the counter argument to that is, look, after the Civil War, the federal government wanted to take railroads and run them out to the west. But those were railroads to nowhere. Nobody would put their private personal money in building railroads to nowhere. So the government essentially paid railroads companies to put those tracks in. Now, right or wrong? There is no right or wrong. Those are different policy preferences. And then we have issues in the case study like Cape Wind that are very hard for scientists and analysts to deal with. And that's the health uh, arguments. When people are going back to the NIMBY, not my backyard argument, no one ever makes the argument that I don't want it in my backyard. They'll wrap their argument in something else. And something else is oftentimes a health issue. And a lot of people that have NIMBY concerns will say, well, it's pretty clear that wind power creates or causes or brings out 
epilepsy in people. And so we have wind farm epilepsy, which is allegedly a health uh, issue. And it is a health issue because it's argued in these projects. Or the constant sound of these powers, these uh, turbines going around, will drive people off the deep end. These are very difficult issues to determine if they're real or not, but they're very common in these debates. And then, of course, with all these projects, we have a proposer. Somebody's proposing to do this work. It might be a local government or a state government. In this case, it was the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is the main proposer. They wanted to do this project. And so you've got these pushing people pushing the project. And then you have things that just come out of left field. Uh, at least they're left field in terms of you didn't anticipate that they were there. For example, when Senator Kennedy, the late Senator Kennedy, opposed this project because it was off his back deck, or front deck, I guess, um, his argument was, look, the military, the Air Force has a military installation nearby, and I've been told on good authority that these, this wind farm will cause problems with the radar system and put our military at risk. And I'm not going to support this project until it's clear that this effect is not real. And so that took about three years to resolve, and eventually it was resolved, but needless to say, it delayed the project for a while. And then in these kind of debates, you have other issues that come up which are almost unpredictable. In this particular area, in Nantucket, there are two historic Indian tribes. And if you go back to the Little Ice Age, three or four or five hundred years ago, water levels were much lower because a lot more water was in the uh, glaciers and uh, north and south poles, and so water levels were much lower. And so a lot of these areas that are now underwater were, in fact, burial grounds for these tribes. That was their argument, anyway. And so they petitioned the Department of Interior to declare these areas, where these windmills would be, as historic protected areas. And so you can't desecrate these areas because these are historic graves. Now, eventually, Interior said, no way, we're not going with that. But again, that causes uh, some delays of the project. And then we have issues in these projects that come in campaign payback that really have nothing directly to do with the project. But as I mentioned earlier, these projects are driven by either tax credits or tax subsidies. And so you've got to get those approved by the legislature. And a few years before this project was proposed, the congressional delegations in the upper Midwest wanted a methanol mandate, largely to basically generate demand for corn, which it did, and raise the corn price. And so the Massachusetts delegation voted for this mandate. And when this request for uh, funds came up for the Cape Wind project, it was payback time. Hey, we supported your project years, several years ago, and it's time for you to support ours. Nothing wrong with this. This is how the world operates, but you need to understand it. And directly to our situation here is every one of these types of cases has plenty of scientists for hire. You have university people looking for research and science grants, contracts. They're looking for consulting work. You have consultants at large looking for work. You have federal and state agencies looking to fund their research laboratories. So what's the take-home message? The take-home message is, yes, you do have scientists out there, but science is used by nearly every actor in the policy debate. They're all going to have science uh, involved. Second, science is an effective advocacy weapon in public policy wars. If you survey people, as an example, everybody will come up and say, I detest negative campaign advertising. And everybody detests it. I detest it. But it will continue to be used because it works. And a lot of scientists will complain bitterly about how science is misused in these policy debates, such as Cape Wind. But it will be continued to use, be used as an advocacy weapon because it works. And third, think about yourself. If you were involved in this project as a decision maker, or you had to make an informed decision about how you might vote on it, as a user of science, just trying to figure out what's going on, whose science would you trust? Every one of these sources seems to have an angle, including the government, which is in favor of this project. And so where do you get policy neutral 
science that you would actually trust. Well, let's move to the other, the second reality check about the use and misuse of science. And this one is a little different, uh, but I think equally important. And that is, normative science has a corrosive effect on the, on the entire scientific enterprise. I think the <clears throat> advent and the commonality these days of normative science has done a lot to undermine the trust that people and decision makers have in science. Just a refresh here, go back to political or philosophy 101 and look at normative science. Normative science is science that looks like science, it sounds like science, it's usually presented by people who have the credentials of scientists, they look like scientists, they act like scientists, but it has an embedded policy preference. And usually that assumed policy preference is rarely stated, so the average listener the average reader of normative science oftentimes doesn't even pick up on the fact that you're, you're reading normative science, not regular science. And oftentimes the normative nature, the policy preference, is embedded in how the science is presented. Just to clarify a few words here that can cause some confusion, I'm going to talk about traditional science, regular science, which is Francis Bacon type science, as traditional science, and then normative science is, looks like that, but it has an embedded policy preference. Other times you see it described as advocacy science. In other words, science is used as a policy weapon. It's designed to try to convince somebody that they ought to adopt a particular policy versus policy neutral science, which is traditional science. Or, if you're over in philosophy, philosophers like to talk about as the split between is and ought. Science deals with is. This is the way the world works. This is what's likely going to happen given the current trajectory. Oughts are policy statements. This is the way the world ought to be. We should make this decision. Perfectly legitimate, but they're not science. Well, how does traditional science become normative science? The way I presented it, you could say, well, this is pretty obvious. How can this actually happen if this is you know, pretty egregious? Well, let's use a case study. And the case study I want to use here is the California droughts. Now, California has had droughts for a long time. And the last 150 years have been relatively wet. If you go back and look at California climate history for the last 1,200 years, the last 150 have, generally speaking, been pretty wet. Certainly there have been droughts. The 1928 to 32 drought was pretty severe. But if you go back 500 years, you have the so-called decadal droughts. And these lasted 10 or 20 years. And these were much, much more severe than we have now. And if you go back 1,000 years, medieval warm period, you have the so-called mega droughts, which lasted like a century or more. And they were vastly more serious than we have now. These are the ones that wiped out aboriginal civilizations and so forth. These were very, very serious droughts. So given that, and regardless of whether we're going to have really, really severe droughts, even the routine droughts cause problems. So last year, maybe it's two years now, California passed Proposition 1. Proposition 1 had lots of different things in it, but one of the things that they had in it was to look at the feasibility of creating more dams to store more snow runoff so you'd have water available in August. Now, this is not exactly an original idea. There's plenty of dams that were built to do this exact function, but there's still additional possibility to store more runoff. So the issue on a table is put a dam on River A to create Reservoir B. Now, let's play a little participatory game here. Imagine that you are called up and said, hey, you won a prize here. You're going to be a team member on the governor's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary study to assess the ecological or environmental or whatever effects on a proposed dam. So you are a team member. After three years, you finish your report. And we'll stipulate that this report is fabulous. There is no scientific debate. It is the revealed truth. There's basically no argument. There's never been a report like this, but I just imagine this was the perfect report. How would you present your results to the public, to the governor, anybody else? 
what kind of words would you use to describe this science, which is beyond debate. There's no argument about the science. Would you use words like ecosystem degradation? If ecosystem degradation is used in scientific reports, in my view, that's normative science. Because what that implies is condition A, free-flowing river, is superior to condition B, a dammed river. Now, there's no doubt that there are very different ecosystems. There's many changes there. But they're not better or worse until you apply a policy preference. And that is outside the realm of science. Or you could take the exact same science, no difference, and call it ecosystem improvement. Is that normative science? I would say clearly is yes, because if you just say that, you've said essentially, in effect, condition B is better than condition A. Therefore, you've improved it. There is nothing in the science that says that condition B is better or worse than condition A until you step outside of science and apply a policy preference. The better terminology, I think, are things like words like ecosystem alteration. There is no doubt that ecological function, environmental function, hydrology, everything else, soils, the whole bit, are greatly different between these two states. But they're not better or worse until you apply a policy preference. Now, how do I determine if I'm a scientist if I've slipped in the normative science? My recommendation is you ask others what policy message is conveyed, what do they hear when they either listen to you or read? Is there a built-in policy message? Now, most of us live in disciplinary tribes. Our kindred spirits, the people we work with, tend to share the same political views, etc. So you've got to step outside that, get somebody, uh, somebody on the street and say, if I said this to you, does that imply a policy preference in this scientific statement? That's probably the best, not your intent, what you intend to do is provide policy neutral science, but the question is, what does the person hear? What, is, what knowledge is actually conveyed? OK, those were the two realities about science, <clears throat> about science and water resource management. First of all, science is not the key to resolving policy and management disputes. Important, yes, but not the key. And normative science has a corrosive effect on the entire scientific enterprise. So let's wrap up with some practical take-home messages. And I'm going to offer seven. First, policy making is about picking winners and losers. <clears throat> That's just a fact of life. And therefore, since management implements policies, you should expect management to be similarly contentious. If somebody comes in in a policy debate and says there's a win-win solution is Invariably, that person is running for office because win-win just doesn't exist in these issues. They're usually winners. They're always winners and losers. And my experience is the losers are never entirely happy about being political losers. Secondly, it's clashing policy preferences, i.e. the values, not science, that are typically at the core of these policy debates. People have different values, and science really can do anything about that. Those values are there. They're not based on science. They're based on other kinds of things. And so science really can't contribute to resolving that. In a democracy, and we, it's always important to recognize that we do live in a democracy versus a technocracy. In a democracy, the values, that is the policy preferences of scientists, are no more important than the values of others. Scientists are experts in their field of knowledge, in their scientific field of knowledge. But when you step outside of that and get into value debates, which is really at the core of policy, the values of scientists are no more important or valuable in a democracy than the values of anyone else. Fourth, policy advocates will routinely wrap themselves and their pitches in science. And this is OK. The job of an advocate is to sell the policy preferences of himself or the organization, and they'll use whatever technique works. 
And so they'll use and misuse science, and that's perfectly okay. It's not good science practice, but hey, they're not scientists. They're advocates. They're trying to pitch their policy preference. If they wrap their preference in scientists, in science, this will tend to sell better with the public. And this is perfectly fine. Fifth, advocates, policy advocates, both individual and groups, will oftentimes hide policy preferences in what appears to be policy neutral science, i.e. is normative science. And so a good advocate can make science, its advocacy science, look just like regular science. And if you're effective in your advocacy, the average listener, the average reader, will never pick up on it. Sixth, if you want to be a scientist, that is a policy neutral scientist, whether it's intentional or not, if you slip into normative science, that is stealth policy advocacy. And the reason that's stealth is because the average listener, the average reader, doesn't even realize that you're subtly pitching a policy preference. And so you can't hide behind the view that it was intentional or not, it was an innocent mistake. Whether it's innocent or not, you are in fact slipping into policy advocacy. Seventh, sticking to policy neutral science, traditional science, does not preclude playing a useful role in policy, management, or advocacy. I'm very definitely not of the view as to stay in your laboratory and periodically publish in the peer-reviewed literature and maybe somebody out there will find your article and might find it useful. I think you ought to play, if you're, especially if you're a publicly funded scientist, you ought to play in policy, management, and advocacy, but play the role of the scientist and don't get co-opted into becoming a policy advocate. Let me finally wrap up with a suggestion for early career scientists, and that is these can be very, very divisive policy issues, and you want to develop your understanding of science before you get dropped into a crisis like this. The role of science can be very clear, as policy neutral science can be very clear, but you've got to have your act together before you get beat on in these types of arenas. Thank you very much.